ladies of el salón the chronicles oye ladies of el salón the chronicles escucha ladies of el Dímelo, linda. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. What day of the what time of the day is that? I don't even know. <laughs> Listen, don't rub it in our faces that you're on vacation. All right. And folks, Cut it we out. are back. It's Liz. Mari. She forgot Hi, her name. Suli. <laughs> and it's Suli. Hello. And folks, today we have a very special guest with us. Uh, she is the CEO of Form Forme Urgent Care and the author of Yo Digo No Mas. With everybody today, we have Maria Trusa. Good morning. Good Welcome. morning. Good morning, said. Good morning, Mar Mari and Suli. Thank you so much for having me here. And I forgot to Thank mention, for I joining consider us. her a very dear friend and a fellow Dominicana. <laughs> yes. yes. Ow. Dominican power. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we're going to hit the ground running. Uh, Zuli, you have the floor with the first question. Or, or Maria, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your projects, everything that you're Absolutely. doing, and then we'll go into the questions. Well, guys, I wanted to uh, just say thank you so much for having me here in El Salon Chronicles. Did I say it right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, you got it. <laughs> um, I, I always start by saying how it is a privilege for me to be here with you because I have a mission of spreading the word and bringing acknowledgement uh, of what is happening, especially with the Latino community. And I think I'll get into a little bit of who I am so that you understand the mission of Maria Trusa. Um, yeah. I am a Dominican. I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. I came here at the age of 15. And um, I've been able to create an amazing life. But it took me a lot of years of pain, a lot of years of darkness, and a lot of work to be able to get out of the trauma that I had gone through. And, um, and I say, you know, trauma is something that we all experience because even now, if you think about it, we are all suffering from the trauma of the pandemic. This has affected all of us in different ways. Absolutely. In, you know, I get to see it. I, I happen to be the CEO of a medical center in urgent care, and we deal with a lot of the Latino community. And we have been able to really be at the front line with our community and seeing all the pain. So trauma is something that we all experience, and uh, we have to learn how to deal with it to be able to get out of it. And, um, you know, I'll take you a little bit on my journey uh, that got me to write this book, uh, Yo Digo No Mas, I Say No More. By the way, the book is in Spanish. Uh, it's in Audible in Spanish, it's in English, and it's being recorded now in English in Audible. And um, so I'm pretty serious about this movement. The medical center is my first mission. So we have a medical center dedicated to our Latino community with a strong focus on uh, really raising the bar for healthcare for our community, especially the undocumented population, people that don't have insurance. My goal being in healthcare over 35 years, probably a little more, I've realized that, you know, I, I was blessed to be able to work with the affluent community and create an amazing career in healthcare. So my, my first dream was to be able to build this medical center uh, where we treat our community with dignity. Uh, the place is beautiful, Liz said, uh, you know, you've worked with us and um, you get to see the treatment that we give our community. And I ha I'm happy to say that when I started five years ago uh, with Gina Capelli, who is my partner in crime, somebody that God definitely I tell her that it's a divine connection. So we together now have a practice that has over 30,000 patients. Crazy, crazy. And so wow. we, we've been, uh, we're on our way to really help this community uh, and continue with COVID. But about a year and a half ago, I, my son, Jeffrey, I have three kids. Um, I have a Franco that's 37, Jeffrey's 32, and I have a 13-year-old daughter, Natasha. 
And um, I was skiing in Colorado with uh, Jeffrey and Franco, and we were waiting for Jeffrey. Franco and I, uh, Jeffrey and I were waiting for Franco to get in, and the flight was delayed, and it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm having a glass of wine with my son. And he says to me, Mom, you have to write a book about your story. You cannot leave this world without telling people and sharing your story because you can inspire. Amazing. You can inspire a lot of women to be able to, and men, um, to be able to realize that you can come from such a darkness and that you can build your life and rewrite your story. So started with that in mind. You know, I said, okay, I'm going to think about it. And it ended up being that a week and a half later, I get a call from a a production company that saw an article that I wrote from um, an immigrant to a CEO. And they wanted me to be part of this documentary is called The Triumph of an Entrepreneur. And the idea was that I was going to be the Latino story. So everything started to happen. I started working with the production team and recording to be part of this documentary. And then I said, I'm going to do the book. So I took on this journey of writing my book. And as I was writing the book, I started sharing my story with many people. I I like to mentor a lot of women. And I took 10 women to Vermont. Uh, Lisette, you've been to Escapo. Yes, I've escaped. I've had the pleasure of of indulging. And by the way, she has a, a, a hot tub that it makes you tell the truth. It's like Wonder Woman's lasso. <laughs> Do you truth go in that serum in the water. <laughs> yes. It's I don't know. That could work against you or for you. <laughs> it's very cathartic. It's very cathartic. You sit there and all of a sudden you just vomito de todo. <laughs> <laughs> She's so right. By the way, listen, you've gotten some patience from that. From the yes. jacuzzi, jacuzzi listen, therapy. Jacuzzi therapy has been very... <laughs> I think you have something new in your hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's that, so this place um, is a place that I built in my head first, um, because for uh, those of you that will get to read the book, I'm a woman that thinks big. I believe in the magic of thinking big. That's So nice. I created, <laughs> right? Lisette can attest to that. I've created this amazing big life in every area of my life i'm I'm very blessed and when you hear my story then you would uh you would realize that wow like you can come from that and actually build a life where your children are doing very well i am i have an amazing connection with my children and that wasn't the case from the beginning i've worked so hard in being the best mother that i could be so let me, let me start telling you a little bit about uh, the story that I share yeah. with the ladies in the hot tub that sort of raised um, the, or gave me the idea of the social movement that I've created, which is called Yo Digo No Mas, which is a social movement that is going to fight against what I'm going to share with you. So um, um, I'm sorry, was, but the yes. but the hot tub. I'm sorry, just a question because you guys keep mentioning this hot tub. So I thought it was like just like a like a hot tub in your house. So this hot tub is part of like a retreat program that you that you have. So my house is called Escapo because it is first of all the place where I escape. But I like to bring people to this house. It's pretty nice. It's in 12 acres of land. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And it has five bedroom and we have a hot tub outside <laughs> where we go at night and we get to one of the things that I love about Vermont is in Vermont in, uh, in near Killington, which is the mountain that I ski. The, the stars at night are like nothing you would see. Amazing. Right, Lisa? Amazing. It's, it's amazing. And there's I took Elise and Joel as well, and they loved it as well. Yeah. Yeah. There is such a peace. And I think that's where the jacuzzi therapy comes uh, alone because there's such peace that you feel being in the middle of this 12 acres with this amazing big trees. And then you have this open space where you can get to see the sky. 
and the sky is like the stars are right here, like in, in front of you. We turn off all the lights in the house so that you get to feel that experience. So it's mm -hmm. like a divine experience. And I think everybody's guards go down. But at the same time, I am somebody that let my guards down completely. And if you, when you get to read the book, you will see it. I don't leave anything. I mean, I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, the things that I'm wow. not, that I'm, that I was ashamed of because I'm not ashamed of anything in my life right now. I've gotten to a place where I'm okay with the life I lived and the life that I'm living because I am, I know God sees my heart. Like it, he's the one that has to see my, the heart. So the other people that are, that might judge are people that can be judged. There's not a soul that cannot be judged. So going back to the uh, jacuzzi. So I started sharing the story of when I was uh, a little girl in the Dominican Republic. At the age of eight, my mother had to come to the United States because she got divorced from my father, who was an alcoholic, and she couldn't support the family. Uh, there's five of five kids, and it's just her making two dollars a week in a in a cafeteria in the Dominican Republic, and she's like, "I'm my kids are going to die. Like, how do I survive?" So she ended up having to leave me. And my brother Billy, that was that at that time he was 11 years old. Um, yep, he was 10. And then uh, my little brother, that was about three years old, wow, she had babies. to leave us. And then she brought two of my older uh, older brothers with her so that they can work and support us. But we had to split. And uh, um, we'll make that story. It's a long story. I'll make it. Uh, try to make it short. So I ended up leaving one year without my, my brothers and my mom. So imagine the abandonment issues that I ended up having in my life that I'm still dealing with, uh, but I deal with it less because it defines you for so many years. So then the worst thing happened is that I wanted my little brothers with me and my mom was able to, and I say the worst because you'll see what happens after. My mom was able to get us a house and she got a woman, Paula, that's still in my life. I, I, we actually support her in the Dominican Republic, even though after, after all these years, uh, she's been in our lives. Paula moved in with us and they said to my father, the only thing he had to do was bring the food and that they'll pay for everything else, including Paula. So my dad was an alcoholic and drank every night. And my dad, uh, one night, made the worst mistake of his life that actually, um, I would say cost him his life because he lost everything after that. But it didn't just cost him his life. It cost many years of my life. One night in the middle of the night, my father comes with uh, this guy who's a brujo. He's a witchcraft man that had, you know, my father believing in brujeria and all of that. So they're um, taking in the middle of the night, my little brother with them. Wait, which one, and the three-year-old? The Yep, the three-year-old. And so I started screaming and I said, you can't take them. You can't take him, you can't take him. And uh, the lady that was taking care of us said, you know, this is your dad, I can't do anything. So I started screaming and my father said, then if he doesn't go, then you're gonna go. And mind you, in that era, uh, there's been cases of people, kids that were sacrificed. So oh it is said, you know, some people believe that in a way I saved my little brother's life, um, sacrificing almost mine. So my father took me um, with this man in the car and then he drops me off in his house. He takes me into where he does, there was a room where he did all the witchcraft and he had a santuario, you know, where he did all the, uh, the, the, the brujeria. And um, the man forced me, mind you, I'm nine years old. The man forced me to drink a bottle of whiskey. Not a bottle? A bottle. Wait, wait, how old were you again? 
nine years nine. old. Nine. Oh my God. And I couldn't stop. I had to chug the bottle of whiskey. So after that, he proceeded to take me out of the room, got me in his car, and he took me to a motel. So by the time we got to the motel, I'm already feeling the effect of the alcohol, uh, which turned out to be a blessing, believe it or not. Because what, what, what was going to happen to me after that, if I was not intoxicated by the alcohol, I don't know if I would be the same person and if I would have been able to take to, to really deal with this tragedy the way that eventually I was able to deal with it. Because this man took my little body and raped it the oh entire God. night. And even with the effect of the alcohol, I felt the pain of him penetrating me over and over again. Oh my God. And when you hear me talk this way, and I do this in my book, the first chapter, there is most of the time I get these messages from people and saying they want to hug this little girl because what I did in the book, I described it like I'm describing it to you and even further because I want people to feel that pain. We don't talk about this. No, openly. we don't. We keep I have it. goosebumps. I have chills in my body. Oh, wow. Suli, this is something that I hear all the time. And I decided that if I was going to speak, I was going to say it all. And I want someday the people that might... I am emotional. I am so sorry. Wow. It's okay, Suli. It's okay. I'm, I have to say, <laughs> Maria, I, I, I just want to tell I, you, I did not tell them your story before today. No, no, I, no. I didn't want them to see the book or, or anything. I, I just wanted them to know you for everything else. Um, but I didn't want to tell your story for you. So they did. This is the first they're hearing it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm sorry. I just, I, I, cause I went on your website and I know that something traumatic happened in your life, but it wasn't specified. Right. So I wasn't ready. I'm I'm a victim. Well, I'm a survivor. I don't have tissues. I'm so I'm not ready. I'm a survivor ready. as well. And uh, Mari, I, you are. You know, I. You win millions of people. That is the reason I I decided that I will become a voice for the voiceless. I've been preparing for this. I've taken this wow. mission very serious. Because this man took my innocence, destroyed my life for years. I was so brutally raped that in the morning when I woke up, I could hardly walk. Okay. I could hardly walk. It uh, took me a while to get to the bathroom as I am bleeding. And when I get to the bathroom, as he was already exhausted and sleeping, I realized in the bathroom what happened to me. And I just oh crawled into, the, into this position and I cried and cried. And I realized that my innocence was stolen. My innocence was destroyed and my body was destroyed. He destroyed my body to the point where I had to have surgery and they didn't think I was going to have kids oh, wow. because my ovaries he, that got twisted in my fallopian tubes. Oh my God. Oh my God. How, how did you overcome this? Like how, first of all, how did they find you? Um, you know, how, how did you leave this, this hell that you were in? Yeah. As a nine year old, that this happened to you. So, coming out of the bathroom was extremely difficult for me, as you can imagine, because I said, Is he going to rape me again? And now I'm more conscious. 
and I am in pain. So ironically, he, I guess he got tired. And believe it or not, he took me home. He took me to his house. And by then, just so you know, my father went back to the house to sleep. My uncle, in the morning, gets up and he goes to the house and he is saying to everyone, where is she? And my little brother, my big brother, Billy, um, who actually, I have to tell you, he still suffers from this. My brother still suffers from the trauma because I didn't even know, to be honest with you. Uh, it was only when I was doing the documentary that he was interviewed at his house. And I believe for the first time is telling me that he has lived with the guilt of not helping me because I begged him to wake up and not let him take me. And wow. he said, and I didn't do it. And to this day, Billy is 58, 58 years old. He still suffers from this night. So my uncle took a machete and he was going to kill the man. He was looking for him. My uncle left my, my little brother at his house in case I came and he started looking for me with this man in the little town because it's a small town. They say it's a very small town. Like everybody knows everybody. And my uncle couldn't find me, but the man brought me to the house. Billy is waiting. I get out of the car. He lets me, by the way, he told me, that if I said anything to anyone, I will be killed and my family will be killed. Of course, of course. that's what they always say. <laughs> yeah. It's like they go to an academy or training that, you know, they know how to scare a child into being quiet. Yeah. yeah. So, but he didn't scare me because, first of all, I, it was actually stupid even to say that because after you take this body of a little girl and you you destroy it like it is right. impossible for anyone not to find out because i couldn't i couldn't even walk so my brother billy carries me as i come out of the car because i'm falling and he takes me back into his car and the men drove me back to the house and dropped us off at the house where everybody's waiting and my father was like nothing by the way, that was the last day that I saw my father. The last wow. day. My father went to jail one night, and this criminal went to jail for three months, and then he was free. Oh, oh my God. God. So the these scars were deep, deep. And wow. I talk about it in my book, you get to hear every detail from the beginning until the end and up to the age of 55. And, but what I want people to understand is that when, you, when your innocence gets stolen, and Mari, I know that you, know, you went through this, as you say, you, you share with us that you're a victim. Mm -hmm. The damage that is done, it breaks I call life, we have five pillars as I consider life. Um, the relationship with your body, the relationship with your family, your spiritual relationship, your financial relationship with the, the relationship you create, create with money, and then the relationship with joy, all get destroyed, all of them. So there are people in life that are with, families that everybody struggles in life. Everybody has a story. Mm -hmm. But when you are a victim of sexual abuse at, the, at an early age in your life, at any age, but I truly believe at the age when you're, you know, you're a child, you're supposed to be playing. You're supposed to be experiencing life. There should be that innocent gets stolen and you grow up and you're already destroyed. So all these five pillars get destroyed. And one by one, you have to start repairing them. And sometimes 
we don't even know that we have to repair them, repair them because we, you know, 95% of our subconscious, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm just somebody that reads a lot. I am obsessed with uh, the power of the mind. So I read The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. And to me, this book opened up new possibilities of understanding that if I am, 95% of our decisions are made with our subconscious. So 5% with the conscious and your subconscious were born without a subconscious, according to Joseph Murphy, um, then you are built with a subconscious of abuse and you are, that's why poor people usually stay poor because you are the environment and your parents build your subconscious. So it's like you have this data in the back that in milliseconds is making decisions. It's almost There's building point. on like a broken foundation. That's exactly. actually how I felt my whole life. Like I had like weak support and, and like my parents didn't have the tools and I didn't have the voice to talk about it because of the shame associated. So I, I, I went through like the first half of my life, um, broken and trying to figure out why I was so broken and take and blaming myself for what had happened to me. I no longer blame myself and I've worked on it. Um, but I, I you're, you, you're, ta I, I wasn't prepared for this. My I'm questions sorry, were guys. completely different. So you, you're like, you're, you're in my, you're in me right now. Like you're, you're, yeah. you're squeezing my heart right now because mm. I, I actually, I was younger than you. And, uh, my, my abuse was continuous for a while. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I don't have memory before my trauma. My memories started with trauma and it's taken me so long, but I mean, I'm not going to continue, but I'm just letting you know how this is like so personal to me right now. Thank and you not for only sharing. that. Yeah. Um, it, she has a very powerful story too, Maria. And you know, the thing is, is that it also impacts your relationships as you grow up, your relationships with your family, with your friends, with men that you meet in your lives or significant others. Um, and your story continues Maria right. into adulthood because you had complicated relationships also involved with abuse until now you have a beautiful, wonderful relationship, which we want you to share a little bit about as well because we want to change the mood towards the end we want to yes because the absolutely. story is so powerful <laughs> no it's extremely powerful but for, for me it's like how did you overcome relationship with men and how are you with your daughter as far as yeah. having her basically have a life and trusting the people around her when you're not around because that that for me would be a big issue yeah so you know i took on this healing journey um and, and the answer to with my daughter, uh, I am one of the most trusted human being that you would ever meet. And my kids wow. always are amazed, like, mom, you trust, I trust. And then you take the trust away. And once you take it, you're done. You're done. I Once I don't trust you, then you don't exist in my circle. But I've learned to really understand that the world is full of beautiful people and also very dark souls. And I concentrate on the beautiful people and the beautiful souls. And um, that's the decision that I made. Um, and I made it when Franco was born. I talk about in my book of accelerators or catalysts that help you push yourself to the next level. And Franco was my first catalyst. It was uh, Accelerador. I realized when I had my son, Franco, that I was so broken. I didn't realize it until then. I had chosen his father, who in the book, it's, you know, I talk about how abusive he was. I continue to be raped because raped is when you say you don't want sex, you don't want to have sex and you're taken anyway. So I continue to be raped. I continue to have sex without wanting sex because I did not want sex. I was, I had never enjoyed sex. I did it to, to please the men because that's the other thing we are taught. You have to, if he's your husband, you have to give it to him. 
you have to have sex, even if you don't want it. At this stage in my life, I don't want it. I don't want it. It's right. my body. I'm only doing it when I feel that I want to do it. And that, I say it with pride because that wasn't always the case for many years. So when Franco was born, it was a boy. I did not want a boy. As soon as Franco was born, I did not want this child. And if you see my relationship now with this child, you would say, wow. It's, it's a amazing. beautiful relationship. I, I can attest to it. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how hard I worked to that relationship. But he was my first catalyst and he's been uh, my catalyst in so many ways. I, I love this child. I have an amazing connection with him. But when Franco was a few months old, and I, this is something that will tell you the things that I'm ashamed of, and I'm not ashamed of it because I understand why I did it. I took this child one night. He was crying. Like he was difficult. Like he was difficult because I was not ready for him. I took this child. I choked him because he wouldn't stop crying. I threw him in the bed. He fell on the floor. That was it for me. I'm like, I could have killed this child. I thought I killed my son. That was it. My healing journey started there. I ended up looking for ways to really understand myself. It took me years to get to, I call my life, I look at my life in decades. Like my first 10 years, the most traumatic time of my life to the point that I, at nine, 10 years old, I wanted to die. I wanted to commit suicide. I didn't do it because I didn't know how. Honestly, I didn't know how. Because I do understand when you get to such a dark place that you don't care. I wanted to be sucked by the, by the concrete cement floor in the Dominican Republic and be buried inside. I didn't want to live. But my son gave me a reason to live. And Maria, I Maria, can we take a pause for a second? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, Maria, are you okay? I'm we're sorry, gonna, Mahari. We're going to take a, just a quick pause. To no, give I'm all right. A moment to I'm, compose. I'm, uh, Mari, I'm okay. you know, sometimes I... Thank you for reminding me something. To me, my story is a story. So I disconnected uh, because I actually, uh, I've, I've gotten to a place where I completely understand the, the mission that I have. But I also need to be sensitive that the story does hit people hard. And, and I, I have to take a pause. And you're right. No, Thank no, you. it's, it's, you know, it's just that there are things that I had forgotten. Like as a little girl, I remember like trying to take like those little bear pills, you know, the aspirins, the baby aspirins mm. <laughs> and, and hoping that that would, you know, that that would, I didn't know how to kill myself either. And I had forgotten that. I, you just reminded me. And I mean, I, 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 I don't mind feeling my feelings, so don't yeah. apologize. You know, it's just a memory that I didn't rem that I didn't have that I had blocked. But it's, I guess, you know, that's what happens when you're a victim when you've survived, you know, abuse. You know, and as a child, you don't understand. It's like such an overwhelming feeling. One of the things that I remember was like for my communion, I had to confess, and I was so afraid of telling the priest because I was dirty and I was bad and I was all these things and I never confessed it. So when I went for my first communion, I didn't want to take, you know, la hostia because I was like, I didn't confess that I'm a bad person, you know? And how do you like understand that and rationalize that as a child, you know? I mean, I understand now that I'm not bad, but as a child, like my childhood was just taken. I'm yes. sad for my, the little girl, you know? Yeah. I, um, I got the chance to actually, in the documentary, I went back to the room where I was raped 
and I filmed wow. there and I got to talk to that little girl and mm -hmm. I people Powerful. my kids wow. yeah my wow. my son Jeffrey was very mad at me for doing that in the book I actually uh the last page is the journal that I did after that experience because we reconciling with your little girl is a powerful very powerful experience and I got to show her that I took care of her and Mari, you've taken care of her and be proud yes, for yes. how you've taken care of her and I know you are and I know that it is it is very emotional to connect with that precious little girl that her innocence was destroyed but you're being a voice for the voiceless and that's what we need to do we need to unite being the voice for the voiceless that's why at the beginning if you remember i said it's a privilege for me to be here because i know that whether people are interviewing me or people are in the audience i know that i am a voice for them there is someone that decided that I don't care how people would judge me and the mistake that I made because I wanted to really show how this trauma destroys lives and it goes from generation to generation. I call it the silent pandemic mm -hmm. that is destroying generations over generations, generations because they the you know they say oh you got to train your kids you know they have to protect from strangers 90 percent of the abuse according to the statistics happens within the family structure or somebody close to the family we got to train mm -hmm. kids and parents to protect their kids and believe their kids when they say that that they've been abused or somebody's touching them in the wrong way and that is the reason we have this movement that we created Yo Digo No Mas. And I, this movement is one of the most exciting things for me at this point. But I want, you know, I don't know how long we have because I don't want people to be left with um, the pain and the darkness. I want people to be left with the fact that you can rewrite your story. Mari, you're proven that you can do that, that you can create joy, that you can create a different financial relationship because even the psyche of what happens destroys the relationship with money. I've built wealth. I am a woman that is wealthy and I own it. Good for you. I own it. <laughs> and I tell people always- And don't make I any use... excuses for it. I don't make it. Don't apologize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because we, and I, this is something I want to teach, especially the Latino community, because the relationship with money that we have is not a good one. I know because right. I had it. And I can tell you that I, I read the book, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. And that book, I've read it three times. And I started to really understand how I can visualize because what you think, what you speak, you create. Yeah, we absolutely. We affirm every day. And um, Suli, you ask, how do you get out of it? I can tell you, right. I believe strongly, I got six years of therapy, so therapy is needed. That is why the movement is going to be um, offering and paying for it. My goal is for a year of therapy for all of the victims that will come out and start telling wow. their stories. And I'm already doing this. We're setting it up worldwide. I have a team that I'm working in helping me create this in Mexico, in uh, Ecuador, in Colombia. My goal is to t bring it to the DR. Lisette, you and I have to, this is, you know, you and I have to work we on this. We have a pending team. conversation. <laughs> exactly. So wow. my goal is I want people and I'm going to go and ask all these people that I know that are very wealthy because that's one thing, you know, I've been blessed. I'm ready for this. You know, I feel that the divine. Yeah, shake them down. 
<laughs> Let's make a difference in the world. We're going to get therapy. The other thing is I be, I'm always doing self-improvement. Mm -hmm. I love, I'm working on a workbook that I'm going to be bringing to, and my goal is this workbook uh, is going to be as simple as anyone could utilize it. That I, cause I want to impact the cleaning lady, the, the man that works in as a landscaper. I want to impact everybody. And with the workbook is going to be all of my habits. How did I build my life and where I am now? I am one of the most consistent human being you would ever meet. Wow. I have a big life and I'm able to enjoy all of these different pillars of my life. So in the book that I'm the workbook, I'm actually creating different routines that people will learn how to start doing because I call them accumulative deposits. You can do this daily and you'll get here every day. I'm going to teach people with this book how to create deposits that are positive and how to start getting rid of those withdrawals because yeah. unfortunately the majority of the people that go through trauma they withdraw they don't deposit it's you you just you're so caught up in the trauma that you mm -hmm. become a victim so we need to uh we need to get out of the victim mode because victim versus creator it's very different. Yeah. Even survivor. Surviving. Right. Surviving and getting to live and rewrite your story, not living in the past. And we have to forgive. So forgiveness is a big one. I, right. You want to know how I learned to forgive? And the person that gave me the most beautiful gift that I actually even dedicated part of my book to him. Oh. I will not guess who. Who? My father. Wow. Oof. My father. I didn't even want me... to mention him. I, I figured what My he did father... was unforgivable. So, you know that he's why uh, I, when I forgave him, and I'll tell you the story. My father, I never saw him ever again. Uh, there was one time where I was married and I was in the DR visiting uh, the little town that I left because I never wanted to go back there. Right. I ended up going after I got married and my father tried to see me and somebody told me, your father's coming here. We left and I remember reversing and I actually hit the, 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 the door of this um, gate that they had and I didn't care, I continued, but I turned around and I saw my father in the middle of the street, just standing there. That was. The last, and it was far, so I didn't really see his face. I just knew that that was him. So my father, at around 50, he got a tumor in his brain, and he could not speak. So he asked uh, my uncle. Uh, he wrote, please call Maria and Jacqueline. They used to call me. Call Jacqueline and ask her if she can forgive me on his dying bed. And when my uncle called me, I was like, wow, never expected that call. Never expected that he would give me that gift that I didn't see it as, as he giving me a gift. Right, In a way, I thought it was a little selfish because you're dying now, now you want me to forgive you. Right. But Mari, Suli, and Lisette, something came uh, divine. The divine came and gave me the strength to forgive him. And I said, in my mind, I said, if I'm going to forgive this man, like I'm telling God that I forgive him because he's coming to visit God. And I can give him that gift. And I told my uncle, I said, please tell him he can go in peace. I forgive him. Wow. Wow. And so you saw this when we took a five, <laughs> My uncle called me five minutes later and he said, your father tears came down and he passed. 
thank you for giving him that gift. Uh, he gave wow. me the biggest wow. gift because I said, I hated my father with vengeance. Hated him. But I never saw my father. In just the father figure. And I let it go. And one day, I started to feel for my father. I said, my father was not a bad man. He got, he became an alcoholic. He made wrong decisions. He used to be a good man. He was a man that became, before he got to be an alcoholic. He made a decision one night that ruined his life for the rest of his life. He never, he lost his five children. He lost the connection with everybody there because nobody really wanted him around. He became a loner. He lived wow. hell on earth. So I truly believe that he went to God. And wow. That, I truly believe that. You have and an amazing story. Yeah, you, you know what? You're the first guest to get us to shut up. Because <laughs> we don't shut up, but wow, I just wanted to listen wow. to you. We actually um, don't have much more time, but I have to say that in this short time, I, 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 I want to personally meet you, um, and I'm sure I will. Lizette always talks about you, and always. we haven't had the opportunity, but I guess it's timing, and you know, I feel like you've you i've been through therapy i i you know i walked around with a picture of my little self and i spoke to her and i have a connection with my little girl but i feel like right now i'm like cracked open again and mm -hmm. you know so i guess you know we never stop healing and there, no. there's always work and no. you know you, what you just said about forgiveness i i, I never reached that so maybe maybe okay. you can help me <laughs> reach that my, my my abuser passed and i still have not forgiven him so maria we'll i see a hot i see a hot tub session happening yeah yeah maybe i get myself invited to the hot tub time machine <laughs> yes, I, yes. Listen, and so and so this is what this is now Maria is now we all know they were like what she's doing another marathon uh so you did the 26 mile right two years ago yeah I did the New York City marathon that's at amazing five. and, and now I am she's doing... up at 4 30 in the morning every day this woman <laughs> I, wow. I don't sleep a lot but I want to live a limitless life and I'm going to tell you that if I can leave you a message understand the gift of time time is a gift so how we choose to live the time is up to us. No matter what we wow. went through, every day is truly a new opportunity. And I tell people, I want to squeeze as much as I can <laughs> every day. I want joy, joy, joy. And, and after two complicated relationships, She's engaged now, and she's gonna be married. Oh, oh, she found, oh she found congratulations! The love of congratulations! Her life. And yeah. Wow! He seems yeah. amazing as well. I can't wait to meet him, Maria. Yes, uh, you'll get to meet him. And Mari, I want to invite you because I have a show that is uh, starting to air in um, in May, and it's a show. It's Yo Digo No Mas. And the idea of the show, I have a whole production that I put together. I have an amazing team. We're starting to record in the show. I, it's going to be with audience. Uh, as soon as the mm -hmm. pandemic gets better, you know, we're going to have audience in the show. The idea is that we're going to have a dark story because we get a lot of people that reach out to us through the movement, telling us their stories. And we're going to be analyzing the story in a psychology way. I have my niece happens to be a doctor in psychology, so she's going to be there. I have a lawyer that deals with immigration law. And then we're going to bring a guest uh, that is, I'm going to interview that uh, talks about the healing process and how this person has already gotten to a place where they've healed and they continue to heal because we do continue to heal until the day we die. The idea is to spend less time having to heal and more time just enjoying life to the right. fullest. So Mari, wow. I want you 
on my show. Yeah. Oh, listen, absolutely. We're going to have to put a disclaimer when we put up this episode because we don't want people to necessarily get caught off guard and just say, you know, you prepared. Oh, like what you did to us? <laughs> well, well, no, we're going to, we definitely. Known, I should have known yeah. Maria was going to get into the nitty gritty knowing her. So I apologize to you, Mari, for actually, no, no, and, no, and both no. of you, for not sort of laying a little bit of groundwork. Um, but A little we, trigger warning, but that's okay. We'll share bit. that. We'll share that with our guests. We'll we'll let them know. But yeah. Maria, um, yes, absolutely, yes to anything you say. And um, <laughs> but that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was uh, this was amazing. I truly, true. I mean, I cried. I I got boogers all over the place. But um, <laughs> I just want to say really quick. I'm sorry before we get for anybody to, for our listeners. You know, this is a process like Maria is talking about, and we, you know, we're in a, in a time and era where 90, there's a, there's research out there that 97% of women are either sexually or physically assaulted at some stage of their life. And we're here to tell you that you can still find peace and love and healing in this process. Um, I think that in different ways, the four of us are a testament to it. If you heard, if you've heard Suli's story in our past episodes, um, Maria, maybe during another time, you know, Zuli can talk about her story. Um, oh. Mari has shared hers. Um, yeah. And I have my, our, my own story. And it, they're, they're different, but they're very similar. And we are still five very successful women in our own right, raising successful children. So the help is right. out there. Um, when you're in that dark place, I just feel it's very important to, to put it out there. If you have any questions and need resources, please DM us, IM us, BM us, whatever you want. Get in touch with us, and we will put you in touch with either Maria through the movement, any resources there, or... Yodigunamas.com. Uh, if people can yes. go there and actually start telling their story, we're, we're, uh, the, we have social media, we have our website, and uh, please you know join us. And also buy the book. Uh, in yeah. my book, I talk about, I give all the tools, I give the gifts that I found in every chapter, and uh, I actually was interviewing Univision, and they call it a Bible of life. I mean, wow. it was, it's been it's, getting it's amazing. A very powerful, it's a very powerful book, and it's not just about telling the dark piece of it, like she mentions. It's really about how you get to the other side, because what's the story without understanding how to get to the other side? So I'll That's give it back true. to you, Mari, with that. Okay, wonderful. I'm already, I, I, I'm looking it up on Audible. Um, <laughs> um, anyways, all right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, like always, we appreciate you all. You go, you guys know the drill. You can find us on Instagram. You can go to our website. We have all sorts of merch and things like that to support the sustainability of El Salon. Hope to see you here next time. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. 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 Ladies of El Salón, The Chronicles Oye, Ladies of El Salón, The Chronicles Escuchan